The calls that we've been seeing over the course of today for a ceasefire, uh, unfortunately, seem to fall unilaterally on Israel uh, and deprive Hamas uh, of agency and of responsibility. Uh, what we're seeing in terms of the debate in Parliament also is requiring Israel essentially to cease its self-defence and its efforts to return the hostages. 134 hostages remain in Hamas captivity with reports of torture, uh, rape and other forms of violence being meted out against them, as well as starvation and the deprivation of medical attention. And Israel has been clear in its aims from the start of this war uh, that it intends to destroy Hamas and its capability to ever conduct anything like the 7th of October again and to return the hostages. What's interesting is that uh, for the most part, the international community was signed on to those aims uh, until now. And this about face is inexplicable because the ability uh, to complete those aims, return the hostages and destroy Hamas, uh, would never have been possible without the final Hamas stronghold in Rafa uh, being subject to uh, this military operation. Uh, and so this is a, a big change in policy uh, and the reasons for it have certainly not uh, been uh, coherent. How fair is it to say that there is a double standard when it comes to Israel, whenever its military response to a terror attack like the Hamas massacres of October 7th that isn't applied to any other army? What we've seen is unfortunately far worse than a double standard. Uh, we have seen in the course of this debate blood libels and complete falsehoods being levelled against Israel and in particular its military operation in Gaza, uh, untruths being told not only about the way that Israel is prosecuting this operation against Hamas but also about the uh, application of international law and international humanitarian law specifically, allegations of war crimes which have absolutely no basis in the reality and the facts or the law. The fact of the matter is that uh, those military and legal experts uh, with an insight into Israel's past military operations in Gaza, uh, as well as an understanding of Israel's operations now, have been consistently clear that, in fact, Israel goes well above the requirements of international law in the precautions that it takes against uh, civilian collateral damage and in targeting its strikes and providing warnings of those strikes, uh, so much so that it's been called the most moral army in the history of warfare. Now, that is completely at odds with what we have heard, with unfounded and untrue allegations of Israel targeting Palestinian civilians and repeated references to casualty figures that are put out by the Hamas terrorist group through its control of the health authorities in Gaza. Now, the casualty figures that have been relied upon in the course of this debate uh, are missing some important pieces of information. Uh, the first is any form of independent um, investigation. Uh, because the Hamas figures themselves cannot be taken as a given. We have multiple examples of clear inflation and fabrication. Uh, the second aspect of the problems with these figures is that they make no distinction between civilians and combatants. And indeed, we've seen many parliamentarians referring to them in the course of this debate as though they were all civilian casualties. Now, Israel has been clear uh, that the number of terrorists it knows uh, to have eliminated is approaching 12,000. What we simply don't know is how many in total uh, are members of uh, Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad, or even uh, perhaps uh, ordinary civilians taking part in hostilities, uh, in taking up arms, um, and therefore becoming legitimate military targets themselves. That we certainly don't know. Um, the other th aspect of this information, which uh, is uh, not something that Hamas is putting out, is how these people, uh, it claims, have died, uh, uh, became deceased. Because we do know that Hamas are targeting their own civilians in Gaza, that they have been shooting them, that they have been bombing, fleeing civilians, convoys, following the paths of the humanitarian corridors that Israel has sought to protect and defend. That is 
Hamas direct fire. Uh, only in the last couple of days, the protests that we have seen erupting uh, against Hamas in the Gaza Strip by ordinary Palestinian civilians, those have also been targeted by direct live fire. And the other manner in which Hamas has been killing its own civilians is with rockets fired by Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad that frequently fall short in the Gaza Strip. And we've seen uh, examples of this famously in the context of the al Akli Hospital car park on the 17th of October. But uh, there are very many uh, rockets that are targeting Israeli civilians that in fact fall short in the Gaza Strip that have also been killing civilians. All of this, of course, all of this important context and the responsibility of Hamas was wholly absent uh, from the debate for the most part. Uh, and the vast majority uh, of uh, par parliamentarians had simply attributed uh, all of the deaths um, to uh, Israel's actions of, of self-defense. Uh, and that is not correct on the basis of uh, what we know about the facts on the ground. It stems from repeated blood libels, allegations of ethnic cleansing, now even of genocide, which are an inversion of reality when we consider that the real genocide was perpetrated by Hamas, acts of genocide against Jews on the 7th of October. And that when we also consider, of course, that Hamas has threatened to do this again and again. And we've seen an inversion of reality uh, and continual unfounded blame being put on Israel. That has been the cornerstone of so very many of the speeches calling uh, for uh, the ceasefire in this debate. An immediate ceasefire would, of course, leave the 134 hostages in Hamas captivity. And it's clear from the hostages that Israel was able to release through its negotiations that it was only military pressure on Hamas that facilitated that uh, humanitarian pause, uh, which was then in very quickly violated by Hamas when it suddenly refused to return the remaining female hostages, uh, and then began to fire upon Israel. So when we think about how the previous exchange uh, was facilitated, how the previous extraction return of hostages was facilitated, uh, and we think about the prospects of the future release of hostages, what this debate and what calls for this ceasefire are doing, are encouraging Hamas to keep going, and encouraging Hamas uh, to continue its, uh, its attack on Israel and uh, to refrain from realistic negotiations and the return of the hostages. They also, these calls for a ceasefire, do an enormous wrong to the Palestinian people because they suggest, uh, these parliamentarians that have been issuing this call, that Hamas should remain. And Hamas should remain in a position not only where it continues to threaten Israel, and repeats its desire to commit the atrocities of the 7th of October over and over again, but where it continues to uh, oppress, uh, torture, and abuse, and neglect its own civilians in the Gaza Strip. And the Palestinians in Gaza deserve better than that. They deserve the support of the international community to rid them and Israel of Hamas once and for all. We've seen uh, the result of previous ceasefires essentially imposed by pressure from the international community all the way from 2008 uh, through, of course, uh, in 2014, um, in 2021. On each of these occasions, Hamas has used the opportunity to uh, expand its terror network and infrastructure and rearm in order to continue to pose uh, what it hopes is an existential threat to Israel. It has been clear about its intentions here. And what the international community and members of parliament in the United Kingdom really need to understand is that by continuing to uh, support Hamas in its efforts to avoid its destruction, uh, they are uh, simply taking us back to a situation where this cycle will continue over and over again. The only hope uh, for the peace that they profess is to ensure that Hamas is eradicated, to ensure that it can no longer govern the Gaza Strip. And in keeping with that, uh, we've heard references to a Marshall Plan for Gaza in the course of the debate in Parliament. Um, it's important to note, of course, uh, that the Marshall Plan 
was set in motion in parallel with a program of denazification. And when we consider the real cause of not just the atrocities of the 7th of October, but all of the terrorism that uh, Israeli civilians have suffered uh, under for decades, this has been the result of programs of indoctrination, which have been funded by international taxpayers and supported by United Nations organizations. 3,000 terrorists crossed the border on the 7th of October, and according to UN statistics, about three quarters of them would have been educated in UN-run schools under the uh, UNRWA system and the Palestinian Authority curriculum. And it is through this indoctrination from kindergarten onwards uh, that uh, we have seen uh, a, an unrelenting support for the program that Hamas has put forward for slaughter uh, of Jews uh, and for the attempted annihilation and, and continued acts of genocide against Jews. The fact that this has been absent from the discussion uh, and that instead this tick box scenario of calling for a ceasefire that would leave uh, this indoctrination and this terror and this oppression of the Palestinian people themselves in place uh, is extremely revealing. It shows that what we have seen on display uh, is a great deal of ignorance and arrogance. And uh, I've also seen certain discussions talking about it in the context of a colonialist imperialist attitude. The notion that the Palace of Westminster uh, would be able to uh, educate uh, those in the region as to what the real issues are and the proper and appropriate paths to peace. Uh, that certainly isn't going down very well amongst those that truly understand what Hamas is about and what Iran's terror proxies are seeking to achieve. When I say that they are playing into the hands of the terrorist organization Hamas, uh, the international clamor that is now seeking to prevent Israel uh, from uh, pursuing its lawful rights of self-defense and conducting these, uh, mi this military operation in accordance with international law, uh, calls that are seeking uh, to put pressure on Israel to desist are serving the interests of Hamas because uh, they are enabling the Hamas leadership uh, to seek to survive, to fight another day. And that is surely uh, the major uh, fashion in which the, the conflict, and in particular the suffering of the people in the Gaza Strip, will be perpetuated. And what's your message to UK politicians? Ultimately, it has to be uh, this, that this is not simply Israel's fight alone. Uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, as proxies of ISIS, uh, see Israel as the uh, first enemy uh, on a very long um, battle against the West. Um, the West is next is a phrase that has certainly garnered currency in recent weeks. Uh, it may sound trite, but it is extremely important to understand that uh, the um, approach uh, and the aims of these Islamist fundamentalist terrorists uh, are contrary to all values of freedom uh, and democracy uh, and Western liberal democratic values. And that has been the uh, key uh, element of uh, the oppression also of the Palestinian people uh, and the inability uh, of proper representative uh, liberal government to flourish in uh, the territories that are controlled, both by Hamas, but also by the Palestinian Authority.